want to have nice jewelry, great. You want to have a couple of great houses, great. You know, there's a paradox to the wealth. You pick the number. Is it 100 million? Is it 200 million? I don't know what the number is, but over some number. Do you know what the number is for you? I would rather not say. It makes me nervous that they're growing up with a lot of money. I think there's a lot of people out there that say, wow, we're so lucky, so why don't we just shower our children with everything that we didn't have growing up? I don't need this. You know, you, I don't need this to live. What do you say to somebody out there who's just sort of a middle-class person? What do you tell them when they look at the life that you're leading? You know, I, I don't know what to tell them. I don't want to apologize for it. Rolls-Royce has long been a symbol of great wealth. Should we start the bidding, please? Once, such wealth was a rarity, confined to a small group of people. Today, their ranks have swelled, swelled so large that the super-rich have created a world of their own. Populated by men like Tim Durham, a financier from Indiana who's worth over $75 million. When most of us need a new car, we take a drive to the local dealer. When Durham looks for an automobile, he flies to Europe. I'm actually in London because there's an auction here of some fairly significant cars. Durham, 45 years old, made his millions from leverage buyouts. His strength is buying undervalued companies. His weakness is cars. They do have phone bidding and internet bidding, so these days you could stay right at home in Indianapolis and, and bid on an auction, but it sure is nice to be in London. It's a great uh, privilege to be able to do this. On this day, he has his eye on this Rolls Royce, which is on the block for a colossal sum. This car is being sold tonight, ladies and gentlemen, for $3,250,000 now. Do I hear $3,350,000 now? 3.5, that's the big. Yep, thank you. Durham finds the weak dollar puts him at a considerable disadvantage as the bidding exceeds seven million dollars. We sold the car and leaving here five hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So he returns home without a new car for now. That doesn't mean he has to worry about hitching rides. On any given day, when Durham visits his two-story garage, he can drive off with the Rolls he already owns, a Lamborghini, a Duesenberg, or even this $1.8 million Bugatti. There are several worth between one and a half and two and a half million. How many cars do you have in here? In here, about 20. Uh, I've got 20 on this level and maybe 15 or 20 on the level below. And then uh, maybe 30 or 40 kind of are scattered around the country and in restoration and certain museums and that kind of thing. So almost 70 cars or so. Right, right around 70. I lose count sometimes. You have a favorite down here? Well, the, the Bugatti's the newest and so it's one of my favorites. What's it cost to change the oil? I don't know, but the tires are expensive. I had a uh, nail in the tire. It cost $22,000. $22,000 <laughs> to tires. change the tire. Change the tire, One yeah. tire. <laughs> Durham grew up in a middle-class family, typical of his peers at the very top of the income ladder. Today, he lives a life of opulence in which money, or the lack of it, is rarely a concern. His main residence is this 30,000-square-foot, eight-bedroom home with a pool, two state-of-the-art kitchens, three bars, an exercise room, home theater, and about 20 TVs, including two in his bathroom mirror. Uh, we wallpapered the ceiling, and, which is another unusual treatment, but you know, my, my decorator can do a lot with an unlimited budget. So. And, uh, is that what it was? <laughs> yeah, I, I came out to be an unlimited You're budget. You're a uh, decorator's <laughs> favorite client. <laughs> As striking as Tim Durham's lifestyle may seem for its apparent excess, he is far from alone. The super-rich have become a species unto themselves. 
Welcome to the new Gilded Age, where huge fortunes have been made by more people faster and at a younger age than ever before. This unprecedented wealth has been sparked by advances in technology, which has brought leaps in productivity, which in turn has created vast amounts of money. An explosion in global trade has allowed that money to be invested all over the world. The result? Extraordinary sums that have descended on hedge fund managers, private equity partners, entrepreneurs and real estate tycoons. They're not merely rich, they are the super rich. In 1985, there were only 13 billionaires in the U.S. Today, there are more than a thousand. According to the Federal Reserve, 49,000 U.S. households now have between 50 and 500 million dollars in net worth. And 125,000 households are between 25 and 50 million dollars. What strikes me today, even much more than the, the size of the greatest fortunes, is just the staggering number of fortunes. It's the breadth as well as the depth that has absolutely no um, precedent. Historian Ron Chernow authored biographies of J.P. Morgan and John D. Rockefeller, the founding members of the last Gilded Age. We've never seen such an explosion, a veritable carnival of wealth being created in the United States, uh, along with the very same kind of extravagant uh, and conspicuous consumption that we saw in the late 19th century. The history of the uh, American economy is that periodically it goes through these great bursts of creativity and technological innovation where new technologies and new products are spawned that in turn create colossal new fortunes. In the period immediately following the Civil War we had the advent of the railroad, and the telegraph, the telephone, still photography, motion pictures, and all of these things created tremendously profitable new industries, and also a particularly extravagant and conspicuous kind of consumption that was so gaudy and so novel in American history that it was dubbed the Gilded Age. I assume the toys of the incredibly rich then are somewhat similar or analogous to the toys of the incredibly rich now? The toys of the rich tend to change very little over time. The super wealthy people then wanted to have large estates, amass beautiful art collections, have gigantic yachts you would find exactly the same thing today. I guess the place where there would be the most obvious difference is that the private railroad cars of the first Gilded Age have been traded in for private jets in the second. That's certainly true for Tim Durham. The divorced father of four makes frequent use of a private jet that can take him, on very short notice, wherever he'd like to go. You're wasting a big portion of your day now when you go commercially. So it, it is a nice convenience to have. Nice is an understatement. For research purposes, we took a ride on Durham's plane to see how the other half lives. We flew on Durham's plane to Durham's boat, which he keeps in Miami. The four-bedroom, 100-foot yacht, which sells for between six and seven million dollars, runs Durham 5,000 a month just for docking fees. Now, how many times have you actually been on this boat in the last year? Maybe four times this year. Three to four times a year. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not a great allocation of resources, no. But so what? <laughs> I mean, well, it's not going to make you a poor man, right? No, no, not at all. It's just, I, I'm probably harder on myself, you know, making money is a game. And when I don't play the game well, I get upset with myself. A math major at Indiana University, Durham went on to get a law degree and worked as a corporate attorney in the 80s. Then he started to buy and sell companies. I learned how to look at undervalued companies and look at uh, turnaround situations. When I started, I bought a forging operation, put a machine shop with it. I virtually had no money, so I uh, borrowed everything. And uh, you know, I think I netted somewhere around 14, 15 million on that first deal. So you made 15 million dollars off of yeah, the initial deal? Yeah, my first deal. So that helps. It helps if your first deal works. And so that propelled me into a lot of other ventures. In 1998, Durham founded Obsidian Enterprises, a holding company he uses to acquire small and mid-cap companies. For Durham, and many like him, 
Making money when you don't need any more becomes a way to keep score in life. Keeping score is important. Yeah, it is keeping score. And, I, you know, I don't think anybody can sit there and say, you know, I need another billion dollars. You know, I mean, is, does another billion dollars help Warren Buffett? No. He can probably make it on the first 50. But why does he keep going? Because it's a challenge. And I think that that's really what making money is about. After you get to a certain level where, you know, you're basic needs are paid for the rest of it is not necessary have you gotten to that level oh where I don't need it oh yeah sure I don't need this you know you I don't need this to live you know what do you say to, to sort of somebody out there who's trying to make it work every single day is just sort of a middle-class person well, what do you tell you them know, when they look at the life that you're leading well I you know I, I don't know what to tell them I'm not you know I don't want to apologize for it you know I think it's what a lot of people strive for because you know everybody wants to live the American dream You've obviously had great success, as it's defined, and I would assume you've, you've become a wealthy man. You could describe me as wealthy. And when you hear me say that, you don't believe it? It makes me cringe a little. I say, geez, am I really wealthy? And then I think about, okay, if I'm wealthy, what's the responsibility that comes with that? It's 6 a.m. in an upscale neighborhood on Long Island. You don't get to be master of the universe by sleeping in. 43-year-old Anthony Scaramucci grabs his liquid breakfast and is out the door. A 12-hour workday starts the moment he gets in the backseat of his car, heading to Manhattan. He makes a call to a partner in Tokyo about a potential investor. Okay, so he's running like a billion three. Um, he's got it spread out into different hedge funds and different asset classes. Scaramucci, with an estimated net worth over $85 million, is a beneficiary of one of the greatest money-making creations in the history of Wall Street, the hedge fund. An investment fund that uses borrowed money to enhance its returns and is only open to high net worth clients. Skybridge Capital. His firm raises money from wealthy individuals and institutions. It invests that money with promising young hedge fund managers. Once we find the manager, we give that manager anywhere from 25 yeah. to say 50 million dollars yeah. of capital. And then in exchange for that capital, they give us a piece of their business. We share that piece of their business with our underlying investors. Scaramucci's career has unfolded during the golden age of hedge funds, which now manage 2.6 trillion dollars. All right, guys. This unprecedented infusion of cash has made many in the business incredibly rich, including Scaramucci. You've obviously had great success, as it's defined, and I would assume you've, you've become a wealthy man, fair to say? Yeah, you could describe me as wealthy. And when you hear me say that, you don't believe it? It makes me cringe a little. I say, geez, am I really wealthy? And then I think about, okay, if I'm wealthy, what's the responsibility that comes with that? I've met a lot of rich people. You get the spoiled, entitled person, and you get the hard driving person too. You know, he means he's this whole blend. Like many of today's Wall Street titans, Scaramucci grew up middle class and has always been a striver, financially and academically. I wanted to break out of that middle class band of wealth, no question about that. Were you the first kid in the family to go to Harvard Law School? Yeah, definitely. I can tell you there's no Scaramucci Law Library at Harvard Law School, that I can tell you. After law school, Scaramucci joined Goldman Sachs. Within a decade, he was running his own hedge fund. Soon after selling that hedge fund, Scaramucci launched Skybridge in 2005. There's a Dubai hedge fund conference in March. I want to get us to these conferences. Great networking opportunity. Scaramucci makes his money the old-fashioned way, with long hours, hard work, and a relentless drive. He may not have to work, but boy, does he. I've been traveling like crazy. I'm probably putting 70 to 90 hours a week on a given week. I'm probably on the road something like 100 to 125 business days a year. Despite the tough economy, there are still plenty of people with plenty of money to invest. Don't worry, bro. With his pitch at the ready, Scaramucci spends a lot of his time hunting for new clients. We just did a deal where the guy had 100 million under management. Right. We gave him 50. Yeah. Now he's got 150, then we went out and raised them. Your strategy is... Wonderful. Scaramucci often conducts business here at the exclusive Core Club. 
It's populated by the newly moneyed elite, most of them from Wall Street. Get a good stretch all the way through. The club opened in 2005. Scaramucci, a founding member, paid $100,000 to join. It's an oasis for investment bankers, hedge fund managers, and private equity partners, people who are both envied and occasionally scorned. There's righteous people out there that will throw eggs and tomatoes at the whole Wall Street crew. There's another group of people who will say, you know what? A lot of giving has come from Wall Street. Once hailed by Fortune magazine as the king of Wall Street, billionaire Stephen Schwarzman, the co-founder and CEO of the private equity firm The Blackstone Group, was soon pilloried for spending millions to throw himself a 60th birthday party. A year after that, Schwarzman won muted praise when he gave $100 million to the New York Public Library. Fairly or not, Schwarzman has become the public face of Wall Street's excess. But there's an endless parade of people you've never heard of who, like Schwarzman, have each earned hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars over the last several years. Even in a financial community accustomed to extraordinary wealth, that's attracted scrutiny and criticism. A hedge fund basically that's charging 2% and 20% of the profits, that simply is, uh, is close to highway robbery. When Bill Gross attacks the new heights of Wall Street's compensation, he knows what he's talking about. He's the founder of PIMCO, one of the largest fixed income investment firms in the world, and a billionaire himself. We spoke to him at his weekend home in Newport Beach, California, located just a few miles away from his main residence. We don't need a billion to a billion and a half dollars worth of income per year in order to justify our existence. Gross pens a widely read monthly letter to PIMCO investors. This one, entitled Enough is Enough, a tax Wall Street's new rich. The rich are different, you write, but they're not necessarily society's paragons. And let's face it, I'm wealthy too. You're one of the wealthier men in this country. Yes, Sue and I share a cornucopia of benefits and I'm not dismissive of that. But let's face it, a hedge fund manager that's making a billion dollars a year is really looking at a scorecard, not at something that he or she can buy. I mean, after the, the first house or two and after those uh, two or three majestic paintings and of course the airplane, if hedge fund managers want to keep score, let them go out and play a game of soccer or, uh, or basketball. These days, with all the money that's descended on their industry, Gross says those hedge fund managers don't even need to be at the top of their game to make a fortune. For example, a billion dollar hedge fund with a modest annual return of 10% will generate $40 million in fees. A lavish windfall split by a very small group of people. It wasn't always that way. They had really good numbers, but well, fourth quarter. Oscar Schaefer, the manager of the $2.2 billion hedge fund OSS Capital, has been in the hedge fund business for over 40 years. Back in the 60s, give money to a hedge fund was like uh, giving dirty pictures in an alley. So what happened? What changed? Well, what happened was a lot of money was thrown at it. You know, in the 80s, if you couldn't throw a football or couldn't play a guitar, you couldn't make a million dollars before you're 40. Then people got in the hedge fund business, it was easy to do it. And it's still pretty easy to do well, it. Well, now it's even easier. Why is it even easier? Because there's more money in that business. If you have a lot of assets, even if you have poor performance, you can make a lot of money. Mr. Schaefer's office. More money than Schaefer could ever have imagined when he started out. I think when I graduated from Harvard, if I had gone into a law firm, or if I became a doctor, or if I became an analyst or hedge fund manager, we'd all make the same. Not anymore. The stratospheric sums being made on Wall Street today have led to a new kind of disparity in wealth among the professional classes. The highest paid doctors are neurosurgeons. And according to the Medical Group Management Association, in 2007, the top 1% of neurosurgeons earned an average of $2.7 million. In that same year, the top 25 hedge fund managers earned an average of $877 million. And according to Institutional Investors Alpha magazine, that top 25 made five times as much in 2007 as they did in 2001. Schaefer's hedge fund returned 26% to investors in 2007, 
which means that he and a handful of his partners took home over $130 million for their work. Well, you've had an extraordinary year this year, and you run a fairly sizable hedge fund. So we've been talking a lot about money here, obviously. Oscar Schaefer is having a pretty good year this year, correct? Correct. We're paid very highly. There's no other business back then or now where you can make as much money. Enough money to afford the beautiful vista from a penthouse apartment on Central Park. For Schaefer, the view from the top is dizzying. And he's far from alone. Historian Ron Chernow says a major difference between the Gilded Age of yesterday and today is the number of people able to take advantage of the riches to be made on Wall Street. Wall Street, if you go back a, a century or more, was dominated by very small private partnerships, limited amount of capital. Whereas today there are so many firms, and these are gigantic firms. Wall Street is just much bigger, both in terms of number of people and of the amount of money. Yes, I have more stuff now. I've got more homes and I've got access to different things that are really fun and really neat. Okay, but I had enough, you know, back then. I don't remember saying, geez, I really need to have a private aircraft when I was living as a middle class kid on Long Island in the 1970s. For Anthony Scaramucci, the definition of wealth and its ultimate possibilities are hard to quantify. You want to have nice jewelry, great. You want to have a couple of great houses, great. You know, there's a paradox of the wealth, David, right? You pick the number. Is it 100 million? Is it 200 million? For my parents, maybe it's a million. Okay, I don't know what the number is, but over some number... Do you know what the number is for you? I would rather not say. I'm not quite there yet. Let's put it that way. Do you think the wealthy among us believe that they are worth just as little as everybody else on a human level? The ones who I like do. The ones who don't, those are the narcissists, and they're not that fun to be with. I try to help them understand why they need to keep spending and why they can only live in one mansion for two years until they get tired of it and get the next one. Bill Fisher has become rich by catering to the rich. His travel agency, Fisher Travel, charges $100,000 just to become a client. Yep, you heard that right. $100,000 to become a client, and after that, $25,000 a year to stay on as a client. Before they pay for any travel that you book for them. Exactly. And they pay this. They pay it. For those princely sums, Fisher and his staff fly around the world, making sure the places their clients stay are fit for royalty. I like to travel the way the clients travel, to know exactly what they need and what they want. And while Fisher's clients aren't dukes and duchesses, they do share the same gilded lifestyle. Young people, 20s, 30s, 40s, uh, usually with two or three children, they travel with their nannies. So these are all the conveniences that they want because they live in these humongous homes and they don't want to travel any differently. When you go to the top, they want higher than the top. We joined Fisher on a trip to Turks and Caicos, where he went to inspect a resort called Parrot Key, located on its own private island. He was greeted at the airport by the property manager. Welcome, how was your trip? And made his way to the island the only way you can get there by private boat. Parrot Key is a favored refuge of Wall Street's heavy hitters. Mid-price villas here cost $2,200 a day. Homes like this one rent for $10,000 a day. Comes with a full staff and butler and is very sellable. Fisher has been booking trips for the wealthy for over 25 years. But it's only in the last few that the ranks of those able to afford his services have exploded. Plenty of clients that we have today are in the billion dollar league. And there's more clients than places to get into. The demand is unbelievable. Bigger than you've ever seen it? Yes. What kind of money are we talking about that people are willing to spend? We for? did a wedding in uh, Florence and that was 15 million. You know, we break down walls for people to give them larger accommodations when they don't have it. I'll call up a general manager. I said, 
Wolfgang, I need a three-bedroom suite. He says, Bill, we only have two-bedroom suites. I said, I know that. Maybe you could speak to your engineer, break down a wall and connect another room. He says, I call you tomorrow. You the break next, down walls yes. in hotels. Yes. Next day, equal. Just season. for somebody who may come and stay for a uh, week. Bill, you have your three-bedroom suite. If Wall Street uh, has a really rough couple of years here, is your business going to suffer? I don't think so. I think the people that we are dealing with are pretty isolated. I mean, they'll have their ups, they'll have their downs, but these are people that could basically afford everything. But Turks and Caicos is not an island unto itself. A quick jaunt around another island of great wealth, Manhattan, reveals the lavish spending of the new super rich knows no bounds. Recession be damned. According to wealth research firm Prince & Associates, 80% of people with a net worth exceeding $30 million say they plan to spend more in 2008 than they did in 2007. It doesn't seem to be much of a recession around the 5th Avenue and 57th Street location of town. These $2,500 pumps, and others like them, are so popular that Saks Fifth Avenue recently expanded its shoe department. It's so large, it was given its own zip code. I love shoes. She, she <laughs> looks for designer shoes, and uh, I know it's going to cost me money. <laughs> At a recent store opening, Gucci debuted $18,000 handbags. But they're not even close to the highest priced item in the store. This big trunk is uh, probably the most expensive item in the store, is a quarter of a million dollars. Audemars Piguet customers shop for watches that cost more than some homes. We start at $10,000 and the most expensive watch that we sell with a diamond on it retails for $800,000. The potential, even with an economy which is a little bit tough right now, is unbelievable. At Bulgari, sales of one-of-a-kind jewelry like this $1 million engagement ring are its fastest-growing segment. And as for the ultimate prize, the private jet, in 2007, despite soaring fuel costs, sales were 34% higher than they were in 2001. And that's not the only spending that's gone sky high. In stark contrast to the wretched housing market for the rest of the country, the high end of Manhattan real estate has never been hotter. This building, 15 Central Park West, is just the latest example. An ultra luxury condo and a monument to exceptional wealth. The building's 202 apartments were each sold for an average of $10 million, long before they were completed. Now that the building is open, tenants are being offered millions more to sell. 15 CPW is home to a who's who of the new super rich. Goldman Sachs CEO Lloyd Blankfein spent $26 million on his pad. Google exec Omid Kordostani shelled out $29 million for his digs. And hedge fund manager Daniel Loeb outspent them both, paying $45 million for a penthouse. Where does the desire to spend such vast sums come from? And why are so many of today's super rich willing to spend so lavishly? Those are questions only a shrink could answer. I try to help them understand why they need to keep spending and why they can only live in one mansion for two years until they get tired of it and get the next one. Psychiatrist Kerry Sulkowitz counsels CEOs, Wall Streeters, and entrepreneurs on corporate strategy and negotiation. But inevitably, their conversations turn to the personal issue of conspicuous consumption. There are people who choose to live extraordinarily conspicuous lives in some ways, with many, many homes, with the plane, with all the accoutrements, so to speak, that comes with great wealth. What differentiates them in terms of the way they choose to use their money? The ones who come from deprived backgrounds, the ones who have deep insecurities emotionally for whatever reason, it's as though they need to prove something with this wealth. And so it's not just enough to have it and to have a, a more than comfortable life and to give money to charity. They have to go beyond that and show everybody that they've really, really made it. I think spending money on these conspicuous items is also a form of competition. And that's one of the ways they can flex their muscles is in who has the bigger house or the better plane.
Do you think the wealthy among us believe that they are worth just as little as everybody else on a human level? The ones who I like do. Uh, the ones who you and I would probably want to have dinner with feel that way. The ones who don't, who have this air of superiority and who really believe that somehow they're better human beings because they have bigger bank accounts, those are the narcissists. And um, they're not that fun to be with. But they bill a lot of hours. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've got plenty of work to keep me busy. <laughs> But you're, you're wealthy. I, mean, you I don't feel this. wealthy. <laughs> I don't know why. I'm going to keep working. I don't know if I can afford to have a hugely different lifestyle, to be honest. Even with $10 million. Yeah, it's absolutely shocking. You might think Hal Steger, a 50-year-old Silicon Valley entrepreneur worth a few million dollars, could finally take some time to relax. But Steger is eternally on the run. Have a good day. Okay, love you. Love you too. As the vice president of marketing at a software company, good morning. he works 12-hour days and weekends. He's now at his 12th startup in 23 years. I would assume you've seen a lot of people make a lot of money. I have. I've seen hundreds of people who have made at least single digit millions, if not tens of millions of dollars. What are you doing after school? Coming home. How much money do you have? We have between three million and three and a half million dollars. That's our net worth. Most people in the country would say that is a rich man. They would, but it's all relative. Three million dollars is not as much as it used to be. You can't afford to have the butler and the limousines and things like that. If you take into account things like saving for retirement, for health care, for college education, don't get me wrong, we don't have to worry about our next meal or about our next mortgage payment, but still it's not like when we were younger thinking like you would have a million dollars. With a three and a half million dollar net worth though, what I'm hearing you say is you do worry about money. Absolutely, yeah. And so it has come to this. More than nine million people in the U.S. are millionaires, but many of them don't feel rich. It's a condition so common it has a name, middle-class millionaires. Do rich people buy more detergent than poor people? Robert Frank, an economics professor at Cornell University, explains the phenomenon. We have people who, by any measure, might be described as wealthy, but who don't feel wealthy at all because they're in such proximity to the incredible wealth that you're yeah. describing. In every group, the pattern's been the same. So if you're a wealthy person, the people at the top of your group will have gained in wealth much, much more than everyone else in the group. So 90% the, of the people in any group feel poorer than before in relative terms. The millionaires used to be able to afford nice views of Central Park West from a penthouse apartment. Now the billionaires get those apartments. In an apartment building in Brooklyn, New York, a woman worth more than $10 million still schleps up the stairs of a six-floor walk-up. In 1996, Laurel Tooby, a freelance business writer making about $40,000 a year, started a website for media professionals called Media Bistro. By 99, we were making money off the job listings, and that's when it really started to pop, and I raised capital in 2000 and then built the business from there. In July of 2007, Tubi sold her website for $23 million, more than enough to join the ranks of the rich, or so she thought. <laughs> oh my gosh, you should have seen my family's faces. <laughs> that's got to be life-changing, right? Well, that's what everyone said. I was expecting a huge, huge life change, and um, it hasn't panned out yet. <laughs> After taxes, Tubi ended up with about $10 million. She and her husband still live in the apartment she bought in 1994. They want to buy a larger loft across the river in Manhattan. But on that island, a few million may not be enough for the home of their dreams. You walk into a space that is $4 million or upwards of $4 million, and it's no bigger than this apartment, and it's dark. I know it sounds like a huge amount of money, but it's not in New York City. Right. But you're, you're wealthy. I mean, you'd be I described as... I don't feel wealthy. <laughs> I don't feel it. I don't know why. I'm going to keep working. 
So are you any happier with the 10 million than you were before? I would say there's definitely less anxiety around money. I don't know if I can afford to have a hugely different lifestyle, to be honest. So you decide what you are and then... And just as Professor Frank described, it was only when Tubi became a multimillionaire that she recognized the huge gulf that separates the merely rich from the super rich. When we first got the windfall, as I like to call it, I called up everybody I had ever met in business who was really wealthy and asked them a bunch of questions. What are your luxuries that you spend on? And one of the guys said, oh, you're going to want to get a percentage in a jet. <laughs> as if. <laughs> well, I later discovered he's got hundreds of millions of dollars. He has no conception of someone like me and what you can and cannot afford. So it was kind of absurd. It would be gone in a second if I did that. So what was your takeaway from all those conversations? After talking to really rich people, I felt very humbled and I felt uh, lucky that I could do anything at all, which is buy an apartment and have some savings put away for a rainy day and for retirement. Uh, I was shocked by how different they were living life than how I was going to live life. We're in a new gilded age. This is the new railroad baron. These businesses, these hedge funds, it's unbelievable what's going on out there. You're just a bit player then, aren't you? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I feel that way. With ten million dollars. I guess. <laughs> I've told my children that majority of our estate will go to charity. I do feel that to leave them everything would be a mistake. You're really going to give most of your money away to charity? Oh, definitely. In October 2003, Glenn Stearns got married in royal style. <laughs> the wedding, attended by 500 guests, was held at Stearns' 15,000 square foot mansion in Newport Beach, California. The lavish affair included a 100 person staff, a six tier $5,000 wedding cake tree, and 50,000 flowers. I promise you this. There is nothing that I would not give. No. All told, Stern's walk to the altar set him back a million dollars. I, Glenn Stern's. I, Glenn Stern's. Take you, Mindy Burbano. Take you, Mindy Burbano. For richer, for poor. For richer, for poor. That's hard to say, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Stern's is far from poor. But given his humble origins, it's understandable why the mere mention of the word makes him tongue-tied. <laughs> Stearns grew up in this 800-square-foot home in a working-class neighborhood of Maryland. He failed fourth grade and fathered a child when he was 14 years old. I thought the world was over, but now you look back on it as an important beginning. I think... Uh, you need to learn through pain, maybe, you know, and you need to find what is the, the positives of anything you do. By age 25, Stearns had turned his life around. He graduated from college with an economics degree, moved to California where he got a job as a loan officer, and started his own mortgage company. Today, Stearns Companies, a financial services firm, has brought the 44-year-old a privileged existence and an estimated net worth in excess of a hundred million dollars. But because Stearns believes his hard scrabble beginning was crucial to his success, he tries to keep his children grounded. It's about opportunity, son. And opportunity sometimes comes like that. You gotta seize it, okay? Stearns has three sons from his first marriage, a daughter with his new wife Mindy, and triplets on the way. The daughter Stearns fathered at age 14, Charlene, now has a child of her own and is expecting another. It makes me nervous that they're growing up with a lot of money. I think there's a lot of people out there that say, wow, we're so lucky, so why don't we just shower our children with everything that we didn't have growing up. But the best way, I think, to make a difference in your child's life is to give them their own empowerment, to allow them to grow and feel that they are responsible for their own success. To help instill that sense of responsibility, Stearns insists that his kids do chores to earn money. 
14-year-old Colby removes algae from the pond. 10-year-old Trevor was mowing the lawn. But you're not done the grass, huh? I'm so thirsty. I know. You got your water. Go. Stearns and his life lessons are always close by. You don't? You just quit a job in the middle of the job. I quit. All right. But chores may not be enough to keep kids humble. When they're surrounded by a level of opulence, most people can only dream of. This is your main residence, but you have a number of others. We saw some video of a beautiful place in Fiji where you go frequently. Right. Love that place. Get away. You got a few other homes too, though, don't you? Uh, a, a couple, you know. What's yeah. a couple? We've got uh, a place in Hawaii. Um, that's great, right on the beach. Place in South Africa, um, which is, again, was a whim. Do you ever go? And, no. And we have uh, a place in Maryland right under Sugarloaf Mountain, which is great. And got then, a place uh, in Montana? Yeah, we got a great ranch that I have um, a few partners uh, in the ranch. And you're living a great life. Yeah. You got some homes you don't even go to. I mean, I'm, I'm living a great life, definitely. It is a life that's not without its challenges. While it may be a high-class problem, the decision of how much money to leave to descendants and how much to charity is a wrenching one for many of the super rich. The numbers are staggering. According to the Boston College Center on Wealth and Philanthropy, over the next 50 years, the richest Americans will leave behind roughly $27 trillion. In a brownstone on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, some of the richest Americans debate what to do with their money while they are alive and after they're gone. We've been looking at our wills again. And now that our kids are older, what do we do? Tiger 21 is part wealth management, part therapy group for the very wealthy. Its members pay 30000 a year in dues. Small change for those who feel the burdens of big money. Do I want them to know that they have money? Does it take away their incentive? My son works, you know, 12 you hours a day, they 14 they hours money? a day. They know, but they know that it's mine. Michael Sonnenfeld made his fortune in real estate. He founded Tiger 21 in 1999 with six members. Today, its ranks have swelled to 170. The number one non-financial concern is children. Uh, since most of our members are self-made, they had a pleasure in triumphing on their own and meeting the challenges. And yet, because they've been successful, their children have been brought up in a very different environment. It makes me a little nervous. As to Some of our members them. think they should leave their children a small amount of money so that they have the kind of drive that the members themselves have. So inevitably then that leads to issues of philanthropy. Well, if I'm not going to leave all of my money to my kids, do I become more or less philanthropic now? My kids are in good shape. It's a dilemma you? familiar to hedge fund manager and Tiger 21 member Oscar Schaefer. He recently gave $10 million to New York Hospital. After I gave my kids some money in the last year or two, I basically have all the money going to charities. My view is that if you're lucky enough to have made it, you should give some back. And I know a lot of people, sons or daughters of wealthy people, whose wealth has basically crippled them. 120 years ago, Andrew Carnegie said, the man who dies rich, dies disgraced. Many of today's super rich give voice to that belief when they talk about their own plans. I've told my children that majority of our estate will go to charity. So I'm struggling a little with what does that mean? How much money is that? You know, and, and I haven't quite figured that out. But I do feel that to leave them everything would be a mistake. All right. You're really going to give most of your money away to charity? Oh, definitely. My goal is to be able to create enough wealth that I could really change something. What's enough wealth? I, you know, every time you hit one mountain, you think you're at the top and you keep looking. Five years ago, it was about creating as much wealth as I could and having as many toys as I could get. And now it's different. Now it's about making a difference. So you're done buying toys? I didn't say that. <laughs>